Um, so I'm Jessica Clemens. I work here in Chicago for a fund called the Edgewater Funds. We manage just under $3 billion of capital formed by former CEOs of middle market companies. So they would say, my founding partners would say they can relate to a lot of the roles that you guys have had over the years of uh, your career. Um, and they started Edgewater really as that group that can relate to the owner operator and their troubles that they encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's the unique kind of perspective that we bring to our portfolio companies. Um, we are very flexible in how we invest. We invest on both a control and non-control basis, which is pretty unique in private equity today. Um, we're generalists, so we invest in a lot of different industry sectors, uh, pretty broad actually, from healthcare services to industrials to business services, uh, government, aerospace defense, um, I can probably name most of the GDP, and uh, look forward to meeting you all. <laughs> I keep coming back, so um, Cheryl's been nice enough to invite me um, event after event. So yeah, it's been very productive for, for um, my group, and uh, we found really high quality executives at, at this event, so um, absolutely. Hopefully I get invited back again. So Peter Ryder with RFE Investment Partners. We're a private equity fund currently investing out of our ninth pool of capital. Um, where we've differentiated is, you know, all of our pools of capital have focused on, you know, the low end of the middle market. So we define that as, you know, companies less than 150 million in revenue at the time that we get involved, somewhere between three and, and 12 of, of cash flow at the point in time that we get involved. Fair amount of buy and builds. So we're looking for opportunities that are in fragmented markets where we can kind of expand um, either the product set, the service set, or the geography through additional acquisitions. Generalists, you know, manufacturing services fairly broadly defined. Yeah, I would say that, you know, when we think of roll-up, we think of scale for the sake of scale. Um, no integration, other things like that. No thought for kind of strategic fit. So when we're, when we're looking at, you know, kind of our companies, we're looking at, you know, kind of what's the strategic benefit of having more than one organization put together. If there isn't a strategic benefit, we don't want to waste and, and distract management's time from focusing on the core of the operation. Hi, my name is Andy Miller. I'm with Wabash Investments. We are a family office out of Indianapolis. Uh, the family is Weaver, uh, own Weaver Popcorn, world's largest popcorn company, uh, control about 30% of the world's supply. Uh, with Wabash, we invest in agriculture, food, and beverage companies. And being a family office, we're fairly flexible. So we'll do everything from minority positions to full acquisitions. Uh, we like businesses in that one to call it $8 million EBITDA range. Uh, and really what we like to invest in are teams who are positioned and are positioning themselves to take their business to the next level. The other thing that we do is we are active investors. What we will not do is give you a check and show up once a quarter. Uh, that is not who we are. And that's part of the reason we're focused in the sectors we are because that's where we bring a level of expertise and a level of help. So this is my first time at one of these conferences. So uh, looking forward to meeting several of you and uh, learning more. I'm Bill Kidd. I'm the founding partner of Kidd & Company. Uh, we are a family office based in Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, this is my 43rd year buying companies. I'm hoping I have another 15 or 20 to go. Um, we buy small companies, some even the size two we buy is generally 10 million EBITDA or less. And we look to underwrite our deals to where we can make a cash on cash return of eight to 10 times in a five year period. Um, one of the reasons why I'm here is that I'm a big fan of Yelena. She's great. Uh, but just to tell you the reason I, I keep coming back is that in, in uh, 2017, the deal closed about June 2017. Thanks to Yelena, we started looking at a logistics company that had that would have software that would help shippers of parcels figure out the best carrier to get the parcel from A to B and how to do so at the lowest cost. Um, typically, companies before our, our systems would either work with UPS, FedEx, or the postal system, have a system dependent on the end of their warehouse management system, which would have a bias depending on who was providing the subsystem. So we bought eight companies that have software, which on a global basis would do what I said. 
and we closed all of those with Elena Snell the same day. Well, I, I think just understanding the basic attributes of the industry and why you find it attractive, um, such as some of the high level attributes, um, is it a capital intensive industry? You know, do, do businesses require a lot of capital to support growth? Uh, because then we're going to have to support that growth with our own money largely and, and that generally brings down returns. So I would say that, um, you know, it just kind of some of the basic attributes, um, general growth rates of the industry, kind of the, the tailwinds that are creating that growth, um, kind of the future opportunities that you see with various um, trends or shifts, um, the addressable market, obviously. Yeah, some. I mean, some funds, uh, like the bigger the better, the bigger the, the, the addressable market, the better, the more interesting or the more um, opportunity. And then I was... Yeah, and then I was talking to another group that said we actually target um, industries sub 600 million. So there are some groups that will kind of uh, go after some niches and they feel like they can play in those really well. Um, so just some of the kind of the high level attributes and then um, kind of if you have a sense of for us, it's always really helpful if you kind of mapped it out more or less as to the types of uh, size businesses in, in that subsector that, that within the within the industry so if you have a sense of kind of is, is the industry comprised I thought I heard earlier about a lot of mom and pops well is it all mom and pops or is that a, you know a third of the market and another third is you know kind of lower middle market and then you have a handful of very large corporates that really dominate so just understanding that um well we are by and bill we you know as Peter and Bill mentioned um so Edgewater funds is what we call we're going to one-up it, executive-led buy and build. So that's why we're, we like to talk to folks like you. Um, and it's hard to build if there aren't actionable acquisitions in, in that industry. So you can identify initial platform investment, but the building part becomes very difficult and challenging if there aren't actionable acquisitions. And so in, in a lot of cases, you need a more fragmented industry to execute on buy and build. Well, we're looking, if anyone has a deal here, so I'm just going to advertise myself, uh, food processing equipment is one we're looking at. So very niche. We have an executive there. There aren't that many, yeah, there, there aren't that many uh, big companies in that, in that sector. And we're very specific, like protein. So, you know, we're looking for a platform. So, um, but yeah, that's just, I'll let yeah, their panel members uh, contribute as well. So, but yeah, so you can go from there to, um, you know, we have uh, so many other strategies that are highly fragmented, and we're going after a lot of um, very small businesses, like a testing service business that we own, where we're at half a million EBITDA. No, we started at uh, I think our initial investment was closer to four million EBITDA, and then. Um, and then we've been scaling slowly. So, you know, I'm trying not to, to duplicate too much, but I think, you know, for us, you know, as we're looking at executives, it's, you know, people that have, you know, are, are looking to stay within an area that they know um, and that they've got personal relationships with so that, you know, we can, you know, kind of start, you know, with uh, an actionable, you know, list that you know, is known to the executive as opposed to having to, to start from scratch. Um, because we're buying and build, you know, somebody that's got, you know, kind of the acquisition and integration experience in their past. Um, you know, I'll give it a quick example of a concentrated issue. We're looking at a company right now that's in the automobile auction industry. So, you know, kind of the wholesale auctions. Um, two large players control 70% of the market. There's probably three or four others that have been in and or have private equity kind of backing today. So we're looking at a management team that wants to build another platform. And, you know, the question is, is you know, with 200, you know, kind of non auctions not owned by those other guys, is there enough left? And if you get to the end, who cares? Um, there might not be any buyers. Um, so um, that would be kind of my quick example. So you know, we'll we'll look at exit for every company we go into. So um, you know, as you look at the market, you look at you know, kind of you know how you can grow the company, whether it's through acquisitions, whether it's through you know internal growth or other you know kind of getting into other areas. Um, we're trying to get a feel for, you know, what do we what do we need to build 
and who is it attractive to at the end. Because um, if we can't see a logical path for multiple different types of buyers at the end, you know, you're, you're kind of waiting for that kind of you know, white horse or unicorn at the end to buy your company if you've created value. So we want to see kind of multiple paths for, for an exit in, in this particular instance. You know, there's not going to be a lot of strategic interest. So what are you really left with? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the best of all worlds is, you know, somebody that, you know, has been operating an industry for 20 years and they've been on the association board. And they know everybody. You're not always going to be able to find that. Um, so, you know, it's it's understanding kind of the full picture of the executive, the buy and build expertise, the industry expertise, the leadership style, um, how well it fits. So it's not, you know, one size fits all. Um, but, you know, there is going to be, you know, getting back to kind of your opening remarks in today's environment, um, you know, it's very difficult to get in front of an owner without, you know, some type of an angle. Um, and if, you know, you've got an executive you can partner with that can open those doors and articulate a clear vision for what they're trying to build, the chances of that owner talking to you are significantly higher than if it's me using a, you know, independent firm or myself calling or emailing trying to get a meeting. Yeah, I think it first and foremost, something Jessica said, it, it's got to be in a sector or in, in a category where we see growth potential, big growth potential. One of the challenges you have in food is there's a lot of legacy companies that really have peaked and, and are struggling to get to the next level. So for us, that first step is, does this idea, does this company have the potential for exponential growth? Because when we get, for example, we're getting into a kombucha company. I don't know how many of you know kombucha. Um, and it's, a, it's an up and coming sector with a tremendous amount of growth potential. So the second thing for us is, does the CEO have some level of experience in that specific sector, or at least in the general category? Um, that's, that's very important. The second thing for us, though, is we'd like to leverage our own expertise. So we talk about opening doors. We tend to believe we can help open those doors in connection with and partnership with the senior leader or senior leaders of the company. Um. Let's start with the basics. Uh, there are three ways you make money in this deal if you go to the man. The least important of which is to pay down debt. That's dollar for dollar. You really don't have to pay down the debt. You have to improve the credit characteristics of the debt. Second way is to increase the earnings. And the third way is to increase the exit multiple over the purchase multiple. It's not, it's not that complicated. Uh, what we try to do is to find industry sectors, not industries, sectors, where the larger, more profitable companies sell at high multiples. And then we will go in and find a smaller company that should have some warts, not cancer, that we can buy at a much lower multiple. Most of the companies that we buy are, and we're industry agnostic, we'll buy it in an industry that's capital intensive or cyclical, every, everything is, it's all company specific. What we will do is we look for companies that have gone from the floor to the table that for one reason or another are not at the ceiling. So to give you an example, and we will also try to buy multiple companies, preferably close them all the same day. So to my knowledge, we're the only firm in the United States that is part of a strategy has bought seven companies. We've done it three times, and they've closed all of them the same days. Sometimes you do it on a standalone basis. A good standalone example is we bought a company called Nextcore, which was a medical device company that had 80% customer concentration. They sold equipment. That's a no-no for bankers and for most private equity firms. But there's a difference between selling lawn chairs to Walmart. You don't want to do that. They'll give you a hard time for a dollar. But high-end medical devices, the buyer has to recertify if they move the manufacturing location. This company was run by a man who was a really good engineer, period. A really good engineer. Made a great product. We got very comfortable that there was a sticky relationship with their customer. Fast forward two years later, we bought a much larger company that made disposables to go along with the equipment. And early next month, we're closing on another deal. 
company that's a design firm and manufacturing firm in the same space. And this year we'll have a business that will do about $98 million of revenue and make about $14 million of EBITDA. And one of the interesting things about that industry is that once you get EBITDA above 10, your multiples can gap up from 10 to 15. Oh, one other, one other thing, the way I like to explain it, I think most of you, particularly the older people, saw the movie 10 with Bo Derek. Remember that? And, and Dudley, you, you can't forget it. Uh, most private equity firms want to buy nines and tens. If you do that, in my opinion, you're not going to make any money. So you want to buy sixes and sevens. Yes, it could be customer concentration, replacing a CEO, dealing with a regulatory issue, uh, moving a plant. Yes, we bought a company eight years ago called Numet Precision Machining, <coughs> parts for jet turbine engines, run by two men who were really good machinists, period. We started in building one, moved to building two, moved to building three, kept all three buildings, totally out of capacity. The employees ate lunch in the room where they stored the scrap metal. The, all of the management team met in an office that was the corner of that room. No systems, none. Their principal customer at that time, GE, said, if you don't fix it, we're going to take the business away from you. To their credit, they realized that they weren't the people to make the changes. So we entered into a deal with them where we gave them the majority interest in cash and a minority in a convertible preferred stock so that they could share in the upside. And we do that for all, virtually all of our deals. Uh, we bought the company. We moved them to a new location. We put in a new management team, installed what are really good systems. And in eight years, we took their backlog from $20 million to $350 million. It's easier for us to put it all together if we can buy them all the same day, but sometimes you can't do that. So we're looking at a, another company that right now that has EBITDA is going from three to $11 million this year. Yeah. Um, we're very interested in that. It's probably not practical to buy, we're gonna buy several companies, but it's not practical to do, do them all the same day because if we wait, for the amount of time it takes to close those several acquisitions, he's going to deliver his earnings for the year. The price is going to go up a lot. It depends. It doesn't need to be 20 years, but you know, industry experience and you know, kind of again, touch points throughout the industry, ideally, um, so that they understand kind of how to network and and um, get to the right companies for whatever thesis that they have to capitalize on those market trends that they see or are kind of going on in the market. Um, again, buying, you know, somebody that's got acquisition integration experience is helpful for us, given that as a big part of our overall strategy, um, people that have shown an ability to lead teams, um, build teams, you know, show, you know, kind of historical, you know, um, successive growth, um, not only in kind of their companies, but in the types of roles that they've had. Um, it depends. I think that's going to be an answer you guys are going to hear a lot. Um, but, you know, part of it is, you know, what is the strategy for the particular, what is the thesis? So if it's, you know, if it's more of a, you know, we're going to go into an industry and, you know, all the manufacturers are you know, really crappy and you can bring techniques and everything else and you want somebody that's coming out of operations. If it's an evangelical, 